All right, good evening. Uh, today is our son Ryan's 13th birthday, and we really wanted to be able to spend that time with him, but also didn't want to skip this session because it would throw off the, the structure of the whole rest of the course. So I hope that doing it this way works well for everyone. The only challenge is that you can't ask questions. Uh, so here's what I'd like to do about that. If you have questions tonight, please write them down. Uh, and then you can either email them to me or bring them with you to next week's class, and we will answer those first before we get into the next session. If you email them to me, then that would give me the time to look up anything that I need to look up uh, in order to give you better answers. So first, let's start with a quick recap of what we talked about last time. We said that Revelation is written by a specific person, John, two specific people, seven churches, at a specific time, somewhere around 90 to 95 AD, in a specific place, Western Asia Minor, in the Roman Empire. The churches that John was writing to uh, were dealing with pressure from the culture around them to worship the Roman Emperor Domitian and engage in behavior that is antithetical to their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, if they didn't engage in emperor worship, they faced persecution, even death. So John is uh, writing this to encourage them to stay faithful to Jesus Christ. He is saying, yes, you may be facing suffering, but ultimately Jesus is going to win. He will defeat these worldly powers that are working against you, and he will give you everything that you need to live. So those are the specifics of the context in which this is written, but Revelation also transcends those specifics in a way that still speaks to us today. Uh, it's not predicting the future or giving us a roadmap to exactly how the world is going to end. It is revealing Jesus Christ and how we can remain faithful to him in the midst of great adversity and suffering. Because of that, this is not a book that we should be afraid of. It is a book of great hope. So the first chapter introduces this vision that John is having. God is showing him something that is not in order to convey a message. And then chapters 2 and 3 are pastoral words spoken to the seven churches. But now, starting in chapter 4 tonight... John returns to this vision, and that's where we are going to pick up. Now, we are going to cover a whole lot tonight, eight chapters, uh, eight very detailed chapters, but there is a common theme that ties these eight chapters together. So while I am going to be giving you a whole lot of information tonight, I don't want you to get lost in the details, right? Don't try to remember everything. We're looking for the big picture here. Right, how John's vision is functioning, what it's trying to do. So we will go over the details and then come back to the big picture and the main theme. So the first three chapters were taking place on earth. Chapter four moves the scene from earth into heaven. And we are presented with a picture of the glory of God and heavenly worship. John is seeing the throne room of God. Now, we have to realize at the beginning of this that John's purpose is not to like, satisfy our curiosity about what heaven is like. Now, that's not why he's describing this. Rather, he is answering the question, of who is in charge of the world. Right? John never describes what God looks like here, except to say that God looks like Jasper and Carnelian. God can only be described in terms of precious jewels. It's, it's beyond human comparison or description. So around the throne of God is a rainbow. This is meant to be a reminder of God's covenant with humanity. It's a sign of promise and hope. After the flood with Noah in Genesis, God placed a rainbow in the sky as a sign of God's promise to never again destroy the earth through the waters of a flood. We talked about this some last week. So before we get into all these other images of violence and destruction in Revelation, we are first presented with that reminder of God's promise 
to never again destroy the world. Everything else that happens in this book takes place under the sign of that promise. So, around God's throne are seated 24 elders, dressed in white robes, symbolizing purity and victory. Uh, they're wearing golden crowns on their heads, symbolizing their share by divine grace in the reign of God. Right. These are thought to represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples or apostles of Christ. The, this is the whole people of God, Jews and Christians. John is uh, very Jewish in his theology, and it, it's thought that he was uh, a Jew who became a Christian. His revelation is heavily connected to and grounded in the Old Testament. So John is not just showing Christians as the only ones who dwell with God, but also the people of Israel. This reflects the, the fullness of God's covenant people. So these 24 elders are constantly praising God. They fall down on the floor, they throw their crowns before God, and they sing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive honor and glory and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Who did we talk about last time who wanted to be addressed as our Lord and God? the Roman emperor, Domitian. This is showing that it is only God who is ultimately worthy of glory and praise. The world exists not by the will of Caesar, but by the will of God. In front of the throne of God are seven flaming torches, which John says are the seven spirits of God. This might be a reference to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, uh, which mentions the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and the spirit of piety or holiness. So the number seven uh, represents perfection, completeness, and wholeness. So this is the fullness of God's spirit. It says that, before the throne is something like a great sea of glass, like crystal, right? In Jewish theology and in other parts of the ancient world, water was associated with chaos. It was an uncontrollable force. You needed it to live, but too much of it and you drown, too little and you die. In Genesis, before the creation of the world, there is just this formless, shifting, swirling mass of water. But God brings order to the chaotic waters and makes life possible. When Jesus is uh, out on the sea with his disciples and calms the storm, he is bringing order in the midst of chaos and making life possible. It is also thought that heaven and earth were separated by a great sea, so vast that no one could ever cross it. So th this is showing that even though there is lightning and thunder coming from God's throne, God is in control of it all. The sea is perfectly calm. There is order. Uh, the, the image of the sea is actually going to come back into play several times later in this book, but... Finally, in chapter 4, John describes the weirdest part. And if you read this, you know what I'm talking about. John describes the four living creatures uh, that he says are on each side of the throne of God. Uh, there are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. They are ever watchful. Right? They each have six wings. Uh, and the wings are full of eyes in the front and in the back. These four living creatures also appear in the Old Testament books of Isaiah and Ezekiel. They are described almost exactly like this, even singing the same song that John hears them singing. 
Isaiah refers to them as the seraphim, the highest order of angels or heavenly beings. Now, we don't typically think of angels as looking like this, right? Creatures with eyes all over them, right? One of them is like a lion. Another is like an ox. Another has the face of a human face, and the last one is a flying eagle. Now, there is some thought that they represent the noblest lion, strongest ox, wisest humans, and swiftest eagles in all of creation. So this, this is representing creation, and they are the best of creation. They are representing all that is good in creation. Uh, several centuries after Revelation was written, uh, people identified the four gospel writers with these creatures. Matthew was the human, uh, Mark was the lion, Luke was the ox, and John was the eagle. But that was long after Revelation was written, so we can't really read that into this and say that it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John surrounding the throne of God. Um, but the point here is that they are ever watchful unceasing servants of God, right? What we see in this chapter is power and order. God is in charge of it all. So everything that happens after this, all of the, the disasters and the hardship and suffering that is described later, it is not random chaos, right? Uh, Fred Craddock and Eugene Boring describe it this way. They say, the series of terrible hardships and sufferings that the world experiences are not pictured as independent, random disasters with which believers must cope, but as in the hand of the Creator from the very beginning. It's not that God causes suffering and disasters, but that God has power over it all. This would have been really comforting for the people John is writing to, because as they face sufferings and hardships, their situation is not outside of the power of God. Someone is in control, and it's not Caesar. Right? Michael Gorman says that there are numerous similarities here in the throne room to the rituals associated with the Roman imperial court such as the presence of attendants around the imperial throne, the offering of hymns and acclamations to the emperor, and the practice of attendants and lesser kings giving golden crowns to the emperor. Only God is worthy to receive what others, especially powerful political figures, may want or demand. Our total devotion, our praise, our crowns. So this chapter reveals to us the glory and power of God. The next chapter, chapter 5, reveals to us the glory and power of Christ. And it is the most beautiful chapter in the entire Bible. Right? So much so that I just want to read it to you and then we'll stop periodically to explain some things. So it's chapter 5 starts like this. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back sealed with seven seals and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So the scroll in the right hand of God contains the word of God, the, the will of God, God's eternal purposes and decrees for humanity and creation, but it is sealed with seven seals. And the thinking here is that you break one seal, the scroll opens a little bit. You break another, it opens a little bit more, and so on until you have broken all seven, and then it is all revealed. Uh, now remember, the number seven represents completeness, wholeness, perfection. 
So the seven seals contain the fullness of God's perfect will. But you can't know what it says if it's sealed. Right? So the angel asks, who is worthy to open it? Who is worthy? Who is capable of knowing the will of God? And there's no one. No one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth can know the will of God. The eternal purposes and decrees of God are unknowable. And John begins to cry because if no one can know the will of God, what hope is there? Right? So then it continues. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Jesus Christ is the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. Jesus Christ knows the will of God and can make it known to us. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that has been slaughtered to take away the sin of the world. The Lamb has seven horns and seven eyes. The horns represent power, strength. The eyes represent wisdom or insight. So Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is all-powerful, all-knowing. It says that the seven eyes and the seven horns are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now we just saw uh, that the seven spirits mentioned in Isaiah are the spirits of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, uh, the spirit of piety or holiness. Um, so in Jesus Christ, the fullness of God's spirit, of God's wisdom and power are sent out into all the earth. Now it says that Christ stands in between the throne and the four living creatures. Right? We said earlier the four living creatures, the lion, the ox, the man, the eagle, represent humanity and creation. So Jesus Christ stands between God and creation. But it says he also stands among the 24 elders. He stands among the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the church. But how can he stand between the throne and God and also stand among the 24 elders who are on the other side of the four living creatures there. So you remember, this is not literal. This is imagery that's being used to make a point. And the point is that Jesus Christ is an intermediary between God and creation, but he also stands with creation. And I'm just going to read the rest of it now. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard 
every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever and the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped it says that the four living creatures and the 24 elders are each holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now remember, saints are not a special group of super holy people. That's how we often think about it. Uh, but when scripture talks about saints, it is talking about us, all of us everyone who belongs to God. The word saint is the Greek word hagios, and it just means holy, set apart, right? Literally, it translates to holy ones instead of saints. Uh, the church and the people of Israel are the holy ones of God. And it says that the harps and the bowls of incense are the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the holy ones of God, of everyone who belongs to God. You play a harp, and beautiful music rises up from it to God. You burn incense, and fragrant smoke rises up to God. Our prayers are beautiful and fragrant offerings to God. Now, that image would be very reassuring to people facing hardships and suffering because it would tell them that their prayers are not in vain. They rise up to God. Your prayers rise up to be in the presence of God. But I also want you to notice the image that we have here of Jesus Christ. He is a slaughtered lamb, not a mighty warrior, but he has conquered. Not through military conquest or political power, but through his death. His death was at the hands of who? The Roman Empire. Who say that Caesar is the mighty conqueror of the world and that Caesar is worthy of power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. But this says, no, 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 no. Jesus Christ has conquered the world and has even conquered Caesar, not through killing, but through dying. And he is worthy of power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. He has conquered sin and death and the powers of evil of which Caesar and his empire are one. This chapter is the gospel. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. Christ has come down among us so that we might know and understand the will of God. Christ has died for the forgiveness of our sin. And in response to that, we fall down before him and sing out in praise. And through him, our prayers rise up to God. You still think Revelation is a scary book? This is beautiful. Well, in chapter 6, the action shifts from heaven back to earth. And this is where we are introduced to the famous four horsemen. Right, so, the Lamb has taken the scroll from God and opens the first seal. And when he does, a thunderous voice cries out, Come! or go. The word can mean either come or go. We don't know exactly which it is here. But when this happens, it says there came a white horse, and its rider has a bow, and he conquers. Each of the four horsemen represent a calamity that comes upon the earth. War, famine, disease, and death. And there is a natural progression there that we still see in our world today. First, uh, a, a country experiences war. Someone tries to conquer and a country experiences war. War leads to shortages of food and thus famine. Famine leads to disease and disease leads to death. 
So the horsemen are functioning that way. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. But there is another sense in which something much more specific is going on here. The first horse, it says, is white and its rider is carrying a bow. This is not a random detail. The bow was the characteristic weapon of the Parthian warriors. Uh, Parthia was on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire in what we know today as Iran. And it was on the other side of the Euphrates River and Parthia was never conquered by the Roman Empire. It marked the eastern border of their empire. Now the Romans and, and the Parthians fought wars from 54 BC to 217 AD. It wasn't a constant state of war, but for all those years, they off and on, they were fighting. Parthia was an almost constant threat to Rome. Their armies rode horses and carried bows, and white was a sacred color to them. So there is a sense in which what John is describing here is a successful Parthian invasion of the Roman Empire. God is setting loose this army to come in and conquer their kingdom. The second seal is opened, and a bright red horse comes out. This horse's rider is permitted to take peace from the earth so that people kill one another. Now, what is important to note here is that it is not God who is doing the killing. God permits it, allows it to happen, but it's almost like these are the natural consequences of human actions, and God allows them to reap what they sow. Bruce Metzger does a great job of describing this in his book, Breaking the Code, and so I want to read you some of what he says. He says, God does not approve of famine and death but they are what must follow if people persist in opposing God's rule. God wills community, which is the result of caring and love. Ignore physical laws like stepping off a cliff, and disaster follows. Neglect moral laws, and disaster ensues just as surely. The woes described here are the result of not taking seriously God's command to achieve community, and justice. God does not will the woes, but as long as we are free moral agents, God allows them. So this is what happens in the political, military, and economic spheres when we oppose the will of God, when we try to conquer one another. The misuse of power brings about suffering and disaster. Rome has misused its power, and this is the result. So the third seal is opened, and out comes a black horse whose rider is holding a pair of scales used to measure and weigh. And a voice says, a quart of wheat for a day's pay and three quarts of barley for a day's pay, but do not damage the olive oil and the wine. Here, we see the inflated prices of famine. Normally, a day's pay could purchase over 10 times more grain than this. What's interesting is that, like we said last week, Revelation is thought to have been written somewhere around 95 AD. Well, in 90 or 91 AD, there was a grain shortage in the Roman Empire. In 91 or 92 AD, the Roman Emperor Domitian decreed that half of the grape vines and olive trees in the empire should be cut down to encourage the raising of grain crops. Right? They didn't have enough grain. They needed that to live. So let's cut down the olive trees, cut down the grape vines so we can make room for more grain. Now, this decree was apparently never carried out because there was an uproar in Asia Minor where olive oil and wine were crucial elements of the economy. So again, this is not the wrath of God, but God allowing the natural consequences of the human misuse of power. The fourth seal is opened, 
and a pale green sickly looking horse comes out. Its rider is death. And in the Clint Eastwood movies, we hear that hell follows with him, right? But here, it is Hades. Hades, in ancient Greek mythology, was the god of the dead, the ruler of the underworld. Right? So again, it is not God that is carrying this out. It is the pagan gods and those who worship them. The fifth seal is opened, and we shift back to the throne room of God, where from underneath the heavenly altar, so there's an altar in this throne room, and underneath it, the voices of the martyrs cry out, asking God how long it will be before God judges and avenges their blood on the inhabitants of the earth. So those who have been killed for their faith in Christ are crying out for justice. And they are told, to rest a little longer until the number of martyrs is complete. Now, this does not mean that a set number of people must die before God acts, but that the suffering of the faithful is not outside the realm of God's control. There's a limit to it. Okay? This is intended to reassure the suffering Christians that John is writing to that their suffering will not last forever. The people who are causing them to suffer will face consequences, and it will end. But for now, just take it easy. The sixth seal is open, and there's a great earthquake, and the sun is darkened, and the moon is like blood, and the stars of the sky fall down to the earth. Everything is falling apart. The very fabric of nature is coming undone. The mountains are falling down. Islands are being uprooted. And all the kings of the earth, all the rich and powerful, all the slaves and the free, everyone runs and hides in caves in fear. And they cry out for death. They would rather die than face what is happening now. They tremble in fear before what they perceive is the coming wrath of God and not even kings are immune from it. These images, they are not meant to scare us. They are meant to reassure and comfort a persecuted church that their suffering is being acted on even now. Right? It is not a prediction or speculation about future suffering, but a response to the suffering that they are currently facing. God is taking steps to right the wrongs that have been done to God's people. If, if they see themselves in the midst of famine, death, earthquakes, injustice, and all the rest, then they will see God's justice as coming soon as it does in this vision. So this is not primarily a vision of the end of the world, but of the coming justice of God, making right what is wrong, making new what is old, seemingly throwing creation into chaos and disorder, but actually leveling things out, right? Rich and poor, slave and free, they're all the same in this. This is not meant to inspire fear in the people that John is writing to, but hope. So, a lot has happened in chapters 4, 5, and 6. These three chapters have taken up half of our time tonight. Six of the seals have been opened, but now, in chapter 7, there's a pause before the seventh seal is opened. Everything just stops. It's a chance to kind of catch our breath. This chapter is meant to reassure God's people that they are safe from these calamities that are taking place. Angels come to the earth and stop everything that is happening. Right? All the earthquakes and everything that's being thrown apart, it is still. Not even the wind is blowing. And one of the angels says, do not damage the earth or the sea or the trees until 
we have marked the servants of our God with a seal on their foreheads. You have been marked with a seal on your foreheads, have you not? In baptism, the sign of the cross is made on your forehead. And I, or, or whatever pastor, says you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. It is not God's people who are in danger here. They have already experienced enough suffering. So first, the people of Israel are counted. 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, this does not mean that only a certain number of Jewish people will be saved, that only 144,000 Jewish people will be saved. 144,000 represents the fullness of the people of Israel. It's just a representation, right? Not one of the redeemed is missing. The people of Israel are all accounted for. The 12 tribes no longer even existed in John's time. Some of them were, were gone, had, had disappeared, but they are all here. They are all accounted for. There is also a sense in which this is meant to reflect the way that the Roman military is organized. Groups of a set number. And some Roman legions had up to 12,000 soldiers in them. But it is not the Roman military that is victorious here. It is the people of God. There, and then there is this huge multitude of people from every nation, all the tribes and people and languages, and, and they stand before the throne and the Lamb, and they are robed in white with palm branches in their hands. Palm branches were the Jewish symbol of victory and were used to hail Christ as king on Palm Sunday. The people of Israel have been counted, and now these are the people of Christ who cannot be counted. Now again, this is not meant as a slight to the Jewish people, like only this many Jewish people are going to be saved, but all these other people are going to That's not what John is doing here. John is thought to have been a Jewish Christian. He's not going to represent his own people that way. This is just a way of showing that God's covenant with the people of Israel has now been extended to the whole world, to anyone who professes Christ as Lord. The multitude, they, they sing out in praise to God. The elders and the four living creatures fall down and sing praises. This is a celebration of the victory of God and God's people. Then, one of the 24 elders says to John, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. The churches that John is writing to have been facing a great ordeal. The, angels, the elder says, They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship God day and night within God's temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God's people are safe. They are loved and cared for. They are sheltered. They lack for nothing. They are victorious. Then, at the beginning of chapter 8, the Lamb opens the seventh seal. And with all these calamities that have accompanied the opening of each previous seal, we expect this to be the end. Like, this is it. Okay, the final one is open. This is going to be it. But instead, there is silence. Absolute silence in heaven for about half an hour, it says. Trumpets are handed out to seven angels who, in Jewish tradition, were the seven archangels who served as God's messengers to the earth. Uriel, Raphael, Raguel, Michael, 
Sariel, Gabriel, and Remiel. Seven angels, seven messengers of God to the earth. Then, through chapters 8 and 9, the angels blow their trumpets and bring disasters upon the earth. But in order to put these disasters in context, we need to look at what happens right before they blow the trumpets. One of the angels comes to the heavenly altar with a golden censer, a, a container that you put incense in. And you may have seen in other churches a priest walking down the aisle and he's swinging this container that spreads the aroma of the incense throughout the sanctuary. So he gets this censer and fills it with incense. Now, if you remember back in chapter 5, it said that there were bowls of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. So the saints are crying out to God for help, for justice, to save them from these people who are persecuting them. The angel takes this censer filled with the prayers of the saints, crying out for justice, and the angel throws it down on the earth, and there is thunder and lightning and an earthquake then the trumpets blow and these disasters come upon the earth. But this is not just arbitrary violence and destruction being carried out by these angels. It is like John's way of saying to the church, you are suffering now, but God hears your prayers. And God will bring about justice on those who are making you suffer. They will suffer. This is like vengeance for the persecuted church. So the first trumpet blows, and hail and fire mixed with blood are hurled down onto the earth. The second trumpet blows, something like a great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea. The third trumpet blows, and a star falls from heaven. The fourth trumpet blows, and a third of the light from the sun, moon, and stars goes dark. Now that is something important to note here. All these disasters that come, they do not destroy everything. With each trumpet blast, only one-third of the earth is destroyed, not everything. This is not total destruction of the earth. It is divine retribution being carried out on those who have hurt or killed God's people. Now, that, that may not fit with our theology, this, this notion of a vengeful God taking retribution on those who have hurt God's people. But remember, this is John's way of saying to the churches, God has not forgotten you or your suffering. God hears your prayers. The people who are doing this to you will be held accountable. They will be defeated. The fifth trumpet blows, and a star falls from heaven to earth and opens up a bottomless pit from which locusts pour out upon the earth. And the locusts are allowed to torture the people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, allowed to torture them for five months, which is kind of the natural life cycle of a locust. That's the longest that I think a locust is going to live. These are not literal locusts, and the description of them shows that. These locusts are wearing crowns, and they have faces like human faces, and hair like a woman's hair, and teeth like a lion's teeth. And the noise of their wings sounds like the noise of many chariots and horses rushing into battle. Who rides chariots into battle? The Roman army. If you remember last week, we talked about Emperor Nero who was overthrown in a coup and then killed himself, but not everyone thought that he was dead. Right? Some people thought he was still alive and would come back to power. Some thought he would rise from the dead and come back to rule. The emperor, when John is thought to have been writing, is Domitian. Domitian was thought by some to be the resurrected Nero, and he fashioned himself this way. It's kind of like saying, oh, so-and-so is the, the next Hitler, or something like that. We hear that all the time. Oh, this person is, is just like Hitler, the next Hitler. When John talks about locusts swarming over the earth, he says that the king of the locusts is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, which means destruction, and in Greek is Apollyon, which means destroyer. Now, the word that John uses for king here, the king of the locusts, is 
Basileus, which is also the title that is used for the Roman emperor. John calls him Apollyon, kind of a, a spin or pun on the name Apollo, which is the name that Emperor Domitian liked to use for himself. Yeah, people refer to him as Apollo. Emperor Nero, before him, also claimed to have a special connection to the god Apollo. The symbol for the god Apollo was a locust. So what is happening here is that John is identifying the emperor of the Roman Empire, Domitian, as the force of evil that is destroying the world. And it's not the Christians that these locusts are harming. It is those who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. The Roman emperor is destroying his own people, his own empire. The sixth trumpet blows. And four angels are released who have been bound at the river Euphrates, awaiting a specific hour and day and month and year. They bring with them an army of 200 million troops, just an impossibly big army. You cannot defeat an army that big. They sweep in and destroy a third of humankind. Now, if you remember earlier, we said who is on the other side of the river Euphrates, the Parthian army, who had never been conquered by Rome and was a constant threat to them. So an invading army that to this point has been held at bay across the border will sweep in to destroy the unfaithful. These trumpet blasts do not bring destruction upon the faithful. Everything that is happening here is happening to those who have been persecuting and killing Christians. This is a picture of divine vengeance and justice upon those who have oppressed the church. So, six trumpets have been blown, and we are waiting for the seventh trumpet. Just like six seals on the scroll had been opened, and we're waiting for the seventh, but then everything stopped and it was quiet. Well, here again, at the beginning of chapter 10, everything stops. Another chance to catch our breath. An angel comes down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his legs are like pillars of fire. Cloud, rainbow, pillars of fire. These are all signs of God's promise to God's people. The rainbow, as we've already seen, is a sign of God's covenant to never again destroy the world. The cloud and the pillar of fire are how God was present with the people of Israel as they were leaving slavery in Egypt in the book of Exodus. So an angel descends wrapped in the signs of God's promise. Everything that is happening is happening under the hopeful signs of God's promise. The angel has a little scroll in his hand, not the same scroll that was opened earlier, a little scroll. And he gives it to John and tells him to eat it. It will be sweet as honey in his mouth, but bitter in his stomach. This is the exact same thing that happened to the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel when he began his ministry. He was given a scroll on which was written the word of God, and he was told to eat it, to internalize God's word, and then he would go proclaim God's word to God's people. It was sweet because it contains God's words, but it is bitter because it speaks a hard truth to the people he's proclaiming it to. John is told to take and eat. So, he says, I took and ate. Where else have we heard this language? Take, eat, this is communion language, right? If we continued with the liturgy, we find that we take and eat so that we may proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again. This chapter is meant to reassure the church through God's promises. 
God is present with the church, upholding the church through its suffering, and the church has a job to do, to prophesy, it says, about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. Ezekiel was a prophet when the people of Israel were living in exile in Babylon. He prophesied against idolatry and called the people to remain faithful to God in the midst of a foreign culture. John is identifying himself in that same prophetic tradition. He is a prophet when the people are living in the midst of the Roman Empire, which he identifies as the new Babylon, and he is speaking out against idolatry and calling on the church to remain faithful in the midst of a foreign idolatrous culture. So chapter 10 is an interlude between the sixth and seventh trumpets to remind the church to stay strong and faithful. And finally, we get to chapter 11. The pause before the seventh trumpet continues as John is told to measure the temple of God. And we are introduced to two witnesses. This is one of the most difficult chapters in Revelation to understand. It is saturated with Old Testament imagery from the book of Daniel. But what it says, in a nutshell, is that two people will bear witness to God against the nations. They will prophesy against the nations for three and a half years. Again, not a number to be taken literally. It is repeatedly used in Daniel, that same number. So John is pointing back to that. It's just a fixed time. When these two witnesses have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will kill them, and the people will celebrate their deaths because these prophets, they were like a pain in the neck, always proclaiming God's word and calling on the people to repent. It would be like if all that I ever did was tell you what you were doing wrong and call you to change. You'd get sick of that after a while. Well, most scholars think that it's not important that we decode who these two witnesses are. There's some to say it's Moses and Elijah and there's other thoughts, but ultimately it's not important that we figure out who these are and identify them. The church is meant to see themselves in these witnesses. So after three and a half days, they're killed, and after three and a half days, God raises the two witnesses from the dead and they ascend into heaven to be with God. So the church is being called to bear witness and uh, against bear witness to God against the idolatrous practices of the nation. They will be persecuted for it, they will be hated for it, they may even be killed for it, but God will give them new life. Then the seventh trumpet finally blows. And rather than more destruction, praise breaks out in heaven. They sing of God's glory and majesty and the way that God sticks up for those who have been persecuted. They say, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath has come, and the time for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and all who fear your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Again, a reminder that it is not the people of God who are being destroyed. They have suffered enough. And God does not destroy the earth. Rather, God destroys those who destroy the earth. This chapter ends with a picture of God's temple in heaven. The, the Ark of the Covenant is there uh, within the temple. The Ark of the Covenant was said to this was like God's footstool. It, in the temple, it was where God's presence resided. And so what this is showing us, this is, temple now is in heaven. So God's presence has left the earth. That is an important detail that we will come, that we, it will come back again later in Revelation. This story is about to shift back from earth to heaven 
where next week we will see a great battle break out. But for now, let's bring it all together, all right? Like I told you, there's a whole lot going on here. But the major theme that we see all throughout these eight chapters is that God is in control. It is God, not Caesar, who rules and reigns over heaven and earth. God even has, the pow has power over the forces of nature and allows these things to happen, but can stop them whenever God wants. But God is in charge of it all. And while God's church is being persecuted by Rome, God will have the last word. Rome will not win. The persecuted church will get justice. These chapters are saying you may have to suffer for a little while for your faith in Christ, but it will not last forever. Stay strong, stay faithful, because God is in control and God has got your back. So that's the word to them. Is there a word from God to us in this? Because we are not a persecuted church, right? We get tax breaks. But we have all experienced suffering. Whether it is our suffering or what we see others going through. People we know, churches around the world, or whatever other people experiencing suffering. And so in that sense, the word to us is the same as it was to them. You belong to God. God sees what you are going through. God hears your prayers and God, and it will not last forever. So trust God, stay faithful, because God has power even over this. Whatever you are facing, whatever suffering, whatever hardships, God has power over this and God will bring you through it. So, write down your questions and send them to me if you have them. We will address them first next week before we talk about beasts, battles, and the infamous number 666. I will see you then.